Not a single one of us here is Athanasius, Augustine, Anselm, or Aquinas, but one of us here is Dr. Mark Hansen. And we're back on Far Beyond the Temple Curtain. Now that you know who most of us are who are not, let us tell you who we truly are. I'm Andy Fred from Lakeview Community Church up in Lakeview, New York. Aaron Bjork, Fellowship at the Cross. I'm Mel McGinnis, pastor of Kyantum Congregational. My name is Bob Benson. I'm the pastor of Christ Lutheran Church in Bemis Point. And as we have... Oh, I forgot! But go ahead. <laughs> uh, no, you go ahead! <laughs> and that leads me to be, I guess, Dr. Mark Hansen from the Jamestown Church of the Nazarene. <laughs> Not Athanasius. Yeah. <laughs> Although I like Athanasius. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll probably get into him today because on Far Beyond the Temple Curtain... We're going to delve into the Trinity. We've been talking about theology proper, and when you do that, you talk about God. And if you're talking about God, eventually, that will lead you into the Trinity. Isn't that right, Bob? It has to lead you there eventually. You've got to uh, get a grasp on who God is, and that's what uh, the systematic theology is. Theology is just the study of God, and we are all called as Christians to be theologians. So as we dive in and we start figuring out godly characteristics, and we need to know that because we need to emulate godly characteristics, it, it eventually brings us to this trinity, this mystery that we have within the Godhead. And uh, as we dive in today, hopefully we'll be able to expose a little bit of that um, I think sometimes it's very, very difficult for us to explain because it's other than earthly. It is a godly thing. And I don't think any of us can wrap our mind completely around all the intricacies that are within the Trinity. And whatever illustration you use here on earth to describe the Trinity, it always falls short. short. Right. And the classic one would be the egg. Mm -hmm. There's three parts of the egg, and people like using that as an illustration for the Trinity that may be very elementary and rudimentary, but it falls way short because it simply gets into parts rather than understanding the essence of the Trinity, while the Trinity also is composed of person or subsists in persons. The, this whole conversation could be summed up if we go to YouTube, put in the search, bad analogies, Connell and Donald, and Hans Feeney will explain to us through a Lutheran satire <laughs> the the concept of the Trinity. And it's beautiful. Go to that if you can. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Another every word. every metaphor falls short and you have to go back to the word mystery. It is a mystery. It is a mystery. I, one of the things that I have always used is Genesis chapter one and two. Mm -hmm. I haven't encountered many people that do that. And it's, it's not something that I thought of. It just actually came to me in a dream one time. But what we're talking about here is concrete things, three-dimensional things. And God is multiple, multi, multi-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned more in physics and what we've learned more because of string theory and what we've learned more because of mathematics and electromagnetism and different measuring of, of, of quantum particles, we've learned about multiple dimensions. And that... Uh, God exists in all of the dimensions, however many there are. So he's beyond the third dimension. So when we use a concept of an egg, that's a three-dimensional object. When we use the concept of water, that's a three-dimensional object uh, that exists in three separate type of ways. But when you go back to the book of Genesis, um, uh, and this is a great thing to use uh, with Jews that are, that are coming into faith in Jesus. And one of the things that holds them back is the understanding of the Trinity because they would say, just like a Muslim would, God is one, and it says that in Scripture, mm -hmm. um, is the image and likeness. Um, uh, the two words in Hebrew that are used, one is, it, it's, we tend to think it's like personality, but that's, that's not really what it is. One of the two words that's used there is, as he is, so we are. Um, so when the idea and the concept of, of dimensions comes in, well, we know that, you know, and Paul talks about it, that there's a mystery there with the soul and the spirit, the mind and the spirit, but they're two separates of us. We also have a body. So we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We're a limited three-dimensional trinity. Our spirit is seated with him in heavenly places, but we'll have a new body and a new mind that will be joined with that spirit. <laughs> Well, God is a multiple-dimensional trinity. And it's not described in Genesis 1 and 2 uh, with nouns or with subjects or objects, but it's described in verbs. 
you have the three verbs of creation. You have the asa, you have the bara, you have the yatsar. And the, the, the bara is what God the Father does, creating something out of nothing because he's not matter Ex or energy. Yep. Uh, you, have, you have the asa, the Holy Spirit, which means to remake something bad that's been corrupted and turn it into good. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Oh, inside of us. Yes. And then yeah, you have yeah. the yatsar. And then in the, in the, into the English in Genesis 2, it says formed. Uh, it says no, and in the Book of John, it says in John chapter one, no one has ever seen God, the Father. That's the direct translation. Right. At any time, the only begotten God in the bosom of the Father, He is the one who has explained Him. And I believe not only after His birth, but also before. So He was the one that did the. Jesus was the one, the pre-incarnate Christ, who formed Adam out of the dust. Mm -hmm. He was the one that operated on him to form Eve out of the rib. Um, so this is the, the, un, the unfolding of, of, of this multidimensional God. This the way that I tend to describe it. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, we talk about it, the egg philosophy or analogy, and, and we talk about the falls well short. But I also think that we have to go back to what Jesus said. That unless you come to me as a little child, mm -hmm. you're not going to get this. And I think that what the egg does to me is it, it, it creates a simplistic image of, of something that I'm never going to fully comprehend. Like, to me, it makes sense because, <clears throat> frankly, I don't fully comprehend how a chicken makes an egg anyway. It's a miracle. It, it, it just My chickens just lay eggs. They just appear every single morning. And, and then I take it, and I understand that there are three parts to it. But yesterday when I was prepping for this, um, and thinking about it up at Lakeview, a gentleman walked in and, and he, he gave me just a great, for me, uh, analogy and example of it. He said, you know, Andy, uh, I, I go to work and I, I perform a function there, very different than when I go home and I perform mm -hmm. a function there. Mm -hmm. And he said, now, th this past Saturday, he just got the opportunity to become a grandpa for the first time. Mm -hmm. He said, I am so looking forward to being a grandpa. Mm -hmm. said, a totally different function, same guy, who works at Ford, is a, is a manager, high-level manager, does amazing things there, but that function is different than when he comes home and what he does for his home, and now he gets to add grandpa to that list, a, a third thing that, that same person, same giftings, different, yeah. same character, but different function. And to me, you know, you think about God, and, and Aaron just laid that whole thing out. Same God, different functions. There's a, there's a wonderful icon of the Trinity, ancient icon, and, and the interesting thing is that, you know, I don't know how we could do it, I'm not an artist or anything, but the faces, it's the Trinity all sitting around a table, you guys are probably familiar with it, and, and the faces are all identical. Mm -hmm. The clothing is yeah. different colored. There's an interesting little facet of that picture though, <clears throat> there's one little spot, because you're looking at it be like if someone was sitting here looking at us. So, like, if this is the if we're the icon, then there's a little spot down about here that they believe a mirror was put there, so that when the person was looking at it, they realized they were in that you know what what is called uh, the dance of the of the Trinity, mm -hmm. and and to see they're all they're the same, and yet there's there's these little nuances. I'll put them that way, not differences, but I guess either way, however you want to put it there. <clears throat> but they all have a role. They all are edifying each other. In willing and submission to each yes, other. Yes, willing submission. And yet there is that one spot on that icon. I love that icon because it, it shows us we have a place in that dance. Of the I don't care how we go about explaining it, um, mm -hmm. you know, the simplicity of it. We have to do it, which is why that icon makes me think, uh, you know, St. Patrick was notorious for using a clover, mm -hmm. which I think is better. Um, Metaphor, because all three, assume, I'm assuming it's not a four-leaf clover, all three of those leaves are pretty much the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's not a difference, and yet each one is individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. But still and it breaks down. Whole, yeah, it breaks right, down right. there because yeah. I mean, what does each leaf do? It does An another the same concept, thing, but it's... it does. Yeah. <clears throat> Ahead, Didn't mean yeah. to cut you off. Right. Uh, another concept too that's similar to the mirror, and I've I've seen that, and that's really good. Um, and then you talked about our piece in it, you know, the intimate trinity, the economic trinity, the, God's mm -hmm. relationship with himself, and then our understanding and interaction with him, the economic trinity. But another one that is, is similar to that is, is like light. It says that God is light. 
in him there's no darkness at all. Well, you know, light, the, you know, when, when it goes through a prism, it divides into the colors. And so you have the red and you have the blue and you have the yellow. And so, but it's still all light. But then to our perception, so that we can see it, it's broken apart. It's just perception. And so when someone say, well, I just don't understand, you know, that uh, God the Father and Jesus died and became sin and he was rejected and Jesus says this and so it's, it's the Father and the Son. I said, yes, but you have to understand, we're looking at the light through the spectrum. The red and the blue are both light, but it's divided for us. A great deal of it, and I think it's more than this, but a great deal, at least from this side of the curtain, this side of the veil for right now, and that's what Paul basically says when he says it's a mystery, as you said, Mark, right. is that perception. It is for our perception. Our for our benefit. Benefit, right. our understanding, well, so we can see him. And Aaron, you, you challenged me some time ago to be thinking about the Trinity in a, in a completely different way because we have been invited in mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if the holy spirit lives in us we've been invited into <clears throat> this intimate relationship with god amazing yeah it, it, it blows your mind when you think of it that way and no matter how eloquent our words are to try and describe this mm -hmm. thing we're, we're just going to fall short and that's where yeah. the mystery being part of a mystery is okay. Well, and you understand mm -hmm. the limited trinity of a human being, and then oh, you absolutely. understand that passage in uh, in uh, Ephesians where it says, our spirit is seated. Right. Well, All right. that happens at salvation. So yep. when our spirit is seated there, <laughs> whose spirit takes its place? That isn't that. And we've got to make room for the Holy Spirit, Well, right? now think about that. When it really hits you, I don't, I don't know about you, but... One time, I mean, it hit me intellectually and with knowledge of the Gnosis, but it, it hit me supernaturally one time. I'm, I'm sitting on my couch, and I was so overwhelmed with not only in, a, a feeling of in my, within my own self because of my sinful condition, my sinful nature, mm -hmm. this inadequacy, but it's the, the, humble, the humbling of it, that, that God decides to <clears throat> sit in here, mm -hmm. in this, in this, in, in this. Uh, that, he, that, he would, that, that he would humble himself, mm -hmm. not it, only to death on a cross, but to sit in this. Right. I, and I, to speak I'm, through this. I'm overwhelmed at times that Jesus took on this form. Mm. Yep. You know, he'd never had right. to wipe his nose before. But right. he was in a perfect, in a perfect <clears throat> God man. But then he comes into an imperfect into God. Into an man. imperfect. He, you know, mm -hmm. somebody described it as he took his cloak of glory. An imperfect glory. man. You're not a God man. It, 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 he took off. He took off. Not for my God. I know. Got to fix the inaccuracy. And you notice we didn't edit the show here. All right. So he takes off his cloak of glory, that Shekinah, hangs it up. To come as this, that that is absolutely overwhelming to me. Why would he do that? And a matter of fact, it says in the Bible that the angels still wonder at that. Mm. There's no redemption mm -hmm. for them, and they're mm -hmm. thinking, why in the world would he do that for them and not for us? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, that's I love how you what you said, Andy. Is that yes, all the analogies we can come up with fall short. Every metaphor does, no matter how we're using it or for what we're, for what we're using it. <clears throat> I've got to get my voice up there for you, Andy, so you can check, check the battery, Andy. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, we'll, we'll go on. And, you know, it's funny, I referenced, you know, the, the bad analogies thing on YouTube. But it's funny, they come, at the end of it, they come to the conclusion. Patrick finally just says to these two cartoon Irish guys, um, he recites the, the, the explanation of the Trinity from the, uh, the catechism or whatever it is, you know, I can't remember which one he uses. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And, and these, these two guys say, why didn't you say so? You know, and it's, all, it's more complicated. But here, you know, there's a couple things I get. We talk about God in the church so often. We talk about Jesus. And then Holy Spirit mm. is kind of like elf on a shelf. Mm -hmm. Now we'll pull you down when we need you. You know, he's watching, he's just telling on us. We, which is why I love, and uh, C. Baxter Kruger has a wonderful book called The, the Great Dance. 
And then Richard Rohr, a Catholic uh, priest, just came out a couple years ago with a similar book on the on the dance of the Trinity. I don't have to figure it out. I, I'm done trying to figure it out. I, I'll mm-hmm. live in the mystery because I don't want to miss the dance, uh, to quote Garth Brooks or, you know, mm-hmm. could be quoting American Woman or something like that, but I'm not <laughs> going to. <coughs> that was for you, Mel. <laughs> but anyway, we won't edit that out either. But anyway, um, I want to be part of the dance. I, I can... I can you know, the, the, I love talking about the analogies, and, and I get it. You know, your buddy you were talking about, he's, he's a husband, apparently. He's a father, and now he's a grandfather, but he's still the same person. It's a beautiful analogy. That's the one I like probably the best because mm-hmm. of the different roles, um, except yeah. for the roles. You know, he's also a high-level high manager or whatever, so he has more than those roles. But uh, I, I love that idea. Of the dance, and that is almost as more more a mystery to me than than the Trinity itself. I should say more. It's it's just another mystery. Mm-hmm. Spinning off of what you talked about, Aaron, why would he live here? My question mm-hmm. is, why is the mirror there? That's why what amazes me. I think they're having this. The, the you know I'm gonna. So here's the Trinity sitting around this table having this little party. I'm gonna call it okay. And then they say, Hey, Mark. Yeah. Come on over. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'm like, really? Can I? Can, mm. I, can I come on? Do I? Yes. Come on over. We're, mm. Why do you think you know, we made you? Time, you know what's hard yeah. about it? It's because we Nazarenes don't dance. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, I think that, you know, one of the things that God promises is that he gives us everything we need for the moment that we're in. Right? Mm. And we tend to worry about the next moment, the next moment. Do we have enough for that moment? But it's everything that we need for this moment. I do believe that that's understanding as well. Yeah. Um, and I think that God has given us just enough uh, understanding of the Trinity as far mm-hmm. as the origin that we need. of it that we need. That, that we need. But mm-hmm. what God is more concerned about on this planet it is the function of the Trinity. Yes. The, the different parts. And I love what you said, and mm-hmm. I hope that we get into it because I think... <clears throat> Too many people are sitting around arguing and trying to figure out the origin, and, and that's not at all right. what God yeah. is concerned right. about. Right. What yeah. he's concerned about is what is the function of God the Father, yeah. what's the function of Jesus, and what's the function of the Holy Spirit. And I do believe that we focus probably a lot more on Jesus than any of the other two. Yes. Yes. God the Father, a, a little bit more if you like the Old Testament like I do. Um, but when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I, I do believe that we fall really, really short. That's and right. I love what you said about the, the elf on the shelf, because my nieces are into that every Christmas. Um, and, you know, the fact is they're never allowed to interact with the elf. Mm-hmm. They, they don't get to touch the elf. They just have to look for the elf and find it. But every day it moves somewhere else. Yeah. And I feel like, especially in Chautauqua County, that's that's pretty similar to our feeling about the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. We, we we look for it, we're in awe of it, we kind of question it, we figure try to figure it out, but we never get to interact. Interact. With it. Right. We're in other right. places. You know, my understanding never been there, but but my understanding of Africa and other places where people have gone, there seems to be just a lot more interaction. Um, that invitation, you know, to the table with the, with the Trinity. Um, um, you, you, I'm sorry, Bob. Uh, you you had. Um, and I know you didn't do this on purpose because I know you under, you know this. We've had these conversations, Andy, but it just a, something you said without maybe even realizing mm-hmm. you said it. But let's clarify it because I think we all are guilty of it. Uh, when you referred to the Holy Spirit, you said it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, him. It's, it's he. Right. Yeah. It's him. Actually, it's um, her. <laughs> we'll talk Numa. about that later. Yeah. Uh, but I'm a, uh, not, not a heretic, but. Uh, yeah. no, he's our That's indoctrinated okay. fellow. But <laughs> whether you are liberal or conservative on this, yes. Uh, the, the point is, is that it's a person, the person, personality, just as much as the Father, yes. and just mm-hmm. as yes. much as the mm-hmm. Son. Yes. The Holy Spirit is a person. So, what we tend to do, at least. What I tend to do when I when I am submitting to my sinful condition sometimes, and being selfish, is I'll find myself, I'll, you know, see myself potentially slipping into this idea that God, since God the Father is neither matter or energy, 
I can't even perceive him and he creates things out of nothing and so he's number one and Jesus came sometime and he's coming back but he's in heaven building stuff with a hammer so he's number two Our house, yeah right? right but but yeah, the so Holy Spirit is my yeah. genie in a bottle and yeah. he does exist <clears throat> but only when I need him or when I'm okay with it and other than that, I believe in the duality of God, not the Trinity. The Trinity. Oh, Lord, forgive me. And I think that that well, think is that, what we do. I think what you just said really bolsters my point, that, that mm -hmm. there is an impersonal yes. relationship with the Holy Spirit. It really more is the mm -hmm. it factor up on a shelf yeah. for and, most and, of us. And that's what spurned Francis Chan to write his book, The Forgotten God. Yeah. And, mm. and you want a deeper understanding how do we live in the spirit is my question. How do we live as the spirit dwells in us? It's asking constantly, not what do I want to do, but what does God, the God that dwells in me, want me to well, do? Well, if Jesus said, it's I cannot. selflessness. Yeah, he said, I, Jesus said, I cannot and never will I ever do anything of my own will. So, Absolutely. Um, which tells us not only did he have his own will and never did it, but number two, he was always submitting to the Father. And, this and, willing submission. Right. So if he yeah. does that, how, how, how can we ever assume that we are allowed not to? Mel, what were you going to say? Well, when you think of the Trinity, it gets very practical <clears throat> when it comes to our salvation because all three persons yeah, are at work in it. Amen. You Amen. can't have one without the other. God the Father draws us. Yep. Or God the Father sent the Son yep. to perform. Uh, God sent uh, the Son. The Son performed the work, yep. and the Holy Spirit applies yep. the right. work. All three are in operation. Now, some of you watching, just a little side note here. Jesus was not created in the womb, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's, that's a whole other discussion. But some of us either directly... Or indirectly, and both are heresy, and you need to, you know, e examine this. And I, I believe this is important. Uh, they, we think that Jesus was like created in Mary. Uh, no, uh, he was in the beginning with God. Read John chapter one. And sometimes I think we will will believe that incorrectly, not on purpose, consciously, but we forget or, or we assume something. Uh, go back to you know the importance of, of of who God is. You know Jesus has always existed, um, but at some point in the vacuum of time, however that works, the the physical man body of Jesus was formed from uh, uh, supernaturally in the womb of, of, of Mary. But uh, whatever God the Son is. And we, we say, I, I agree with you, Andy. We, fo we tend to focus more on the what. But God's more focused on the how and the who and um, well, went you know, into that body. Yeah. And, and that body will be there, we know. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and, and this has been something in the last, I don't know, 10 years that has really got me as we, and I look even at our own hymnal. For you young people, mm -hmm. that's a book that you sing out of. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> that's good. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I look at our own hymnal, and I see it, it's, it's different categories and stuff, and then there'll be songs about God, and then there's Jesus, and the different aspects, his, hmm. his salvation, hmm. and his uh, atonement, and, all. and then there's like this little bitty section yeah. on the Holy Spirit, like six songs. And he's the like, one that we interact with the I'm most like, in the church what? age. In the world. Yeah. Um, and I remember... At the church I'm at right now, and it was it was Pentecost Sunday, and we normally we skim over most of the time. I think a lot of churches do skim over Pentecost. I would, I would agree, mm -hmm. right? You know, it was skim, and it's such so a why, such a why wonderful why thing. Why, why do you know, let's ask the it's probably because we don't understand it as well. And the why Spirit is more of a mystery. Why don't we understand it? And I'm asking. I don't have the answer. So yeah, I don't know. Why don't we understand? Because we've de-Judaized Christianity 1,700 years ago. There's my answer. Well, what we don't mean? understand the fulfillment, the explanation, 
uh, of the Jewish feasts and festivals, how Jesus literally fulfilled the first four, how he will literally fulfill the last three, how Pentecost is the church's Mount Sinai, the Old Testament, the giving of the law, the New Testament, the giving of the new law of the Holy Spirit in our hearts in the upper room. Because we don't understand the Old Testament uh, 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 physicality and limited uh, understanding, and we we're new. I you hear this all the time. New you know New Testament churches saying we don't need that Old Testament. God got rid of it. And it's like yeah. Jesus did not create a new religion. Jesus came to complete yes Judaism. To fulfill the, yeah. uh, yeah. three hundred years later at Constantine. That's when they created a new religion. It was never supposed to be that way. So that's just that's, part of it. I think that's in my the, opinion. Part of the problem, isn't it, today that that we really. We have churches we have to that are them. acting yeah. as if Jesus did create a new religion. Mm. And, I, and I think that that's a very dangerous point. That's part of the problem. We have a problem with the Trinity. You know, mm. is that we're getting rid of the Old Testament, which which focuses so much on God the Father, you know, and, mm. and we we created a new religion that, that really focuses on Jesus. Jesus the Son. And specifically, Jesus mm. just said, love everybody all the time. <laughs> And to find that, however, and that means just let him do whatever there is. Want. There Don't is a out, right, there is a really that. good uh, uh, Mark made reference to 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 someone. There's also someone else who has some really good teachings on the Trinity. I, I, the 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 common belief is, and I've been there too, uh, is that the Old Testament kind of just focuses on God the Father. Uh, that's just the Jews' uh, mm-hmm. interpretation of it. There's mm-hmm. actually more about God the uh, God the Holy Spirit, and almost as much, in my opinion, about God the Son in the Old Testament as there is in the New. Uh, maybe even more because of just the sheer more volume of information in the Old Testament. Um, but a, 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 a theologian who's since passed now, but uh, full gospel Pentecostal theologian Chuck Missler uh, has great teaching on uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament. And I encourage you to go on YouTube and type that in and do a search. It's phenomenal. Uh, obvi- you know, obviously the belief about many people, Melchizedek uh, being the pre-incarnate and walking in the garden and every time God materialized in front of, of human beings in the Old Testament, it was a, a pre-incarnate uh, mm-hmm. formation. Uh, and maybe even potentially in some way, shape, or form, a time-traveling Jesus. Uh, but, you know, that's it's, so cool. Isn't that incredible? You know, he's got, he, when he descends into the, uh, the uttermost tra- parts of the earth, or uh, he's, 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 Calvin he's transversing oh, yeah. the multiple dimensions of the creation of well, the universe. No, but he did have a flux capacitor. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Let me, let me ask did it have a Bitford booster on it? <laughs> okay. Let me ask this question, and, and Mel, maybe you can answer it. But, but like, is part of the reason that we stay away in churches from really teaching about the Holy Spirit? Spirit, really talking about the Holy Spirit, is that inevitably that chat always seems to get to the giftings and mm. the speaking in tongues and the and, and the. This is why Pentecostals you know, don't have a problem with the Holy Spirit. That's, that's right, and and, and say, like, because we know it's going that path, and we want to stay away from that path. I think it's part of it. Is that is that? I mean, like Mel, how do you teach the Holy Spirit in your church? Uh, I go right back to a membership class where we talk about the disciplines of the Spirit. Uh, we also talk about the fruit of the Spirit, uh, and we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, so that the disciplines of the Spirit, as well as the gifts of the Spirit, are there to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. So that emphasis there uh, touches upon, of course, Galatians chapter 5, 23, the fruit yeah. of the Spirit. We think of also the uh, gifts of the Spirit in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 14, Romans chapter 12, 1 Peter chapter 4, and the disciplines of the Spirit uh, would include that aspect of not forsaking the fellowship, uh, being in the Word of God personally, as well as in a uh, corporate Bible study, and uh, being prayerful, not only personally, but also as a community of believers. And I got to give credit to Peter Murdy, who's a Four Seas pastor, that is, of the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference, who's very well Say that versed four times fast. I know, in uh, congregationalism and historic congregationalism, which emphasizes the role of the Spirit Amen. in the believer's life. Amen. That's good. So why, why is it that, that we are, especially in this area, because again, th- this program really is going out with the thought process of, you know, it's great to reach out, 
but but really we want to reach in and we've talked about Chautauqua County churches in this area why is it that the churches in this area most collectively uh, seem to not not maybe dismiss the Holy Spirit <clears throat> but are you know a leery of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's role in, in what's going on you know it's fascinating to me but I'm just sitting here thinking about this is it is going back to my my comments about our hymnal um, in the early days of the church in Nazarene, they did talk about the Spirit a lot. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm pondering what your question is. Have we also gotten <clears throat> to this point, uh, and I got caught up in it in the 90s when I was like 10, and then pastoring when I was 10 years old. Um, <laughs> I wasn't, by the way. I, Thank I, you for not laughing. I, Thank you for not I, laughing. I'm sorry, I, I did. I bought it. I thought, oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Bob was over here biting his tongue. When I was first started pastoring in the 90s, and it was the church growth movement that started, and there was a there was this thing where we started talking about we got to preach about the felt needs mm. and the stuff like that, mm. which is fine, which is fine. But we, I, I feel like maybe we moved away. Maybe I was guilty of it, too. Because I've been finding myself, maybe it's because I'm an old man now, I'm gravitating to it and saying, wait a minute, this is stuff we need to talk about. Mm -hmm. And and, and an interesting thing happened a couple years ago when um, I, I, sometimes I lead worship in our church and uh, Pentecost Sunday was coming up. And so I thought, we're going to, I'm preaching on the Holy Spirit, we're going to sing songs about the Holy Spirit. And so it was so interesting because... we, we, we get up there to prepare for worship, and first song, He Abides. Yeah. Everybody familiar with that song, He Abides? Mm-hmm. Okay. And um, <clears throat> my, my guitar players would stand there, and my <laughs> two singers stand there. We don't know these songs. <laughs> I says, oh, that's okay. You, you'll, you'll get them. I do. Just just run with me here, you know. Uh, you know, so we, we sing He Abides. I mean, this baby, you know, it's rolling. You know, He Abides. You don't sing that one slow. You sing mm-hmm. it robust. Robustfully, is that a word? Sing it with gusto. Robustly, you bring it. And um, so, and then we, we sang like uh, Holy. Uh, no, no, we sang Holy Spirit. You're welcome here, but uh, um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, yeah. just great. You know, choruses. Um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is bondage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so it, it was so funny. Because everybody's filing in, and I said, if you want to use the hymnal, that burgundy book in front of you, I said, you can, it's this number, and so you can read the words behind me. And, uh, I mean, boom, we hit this baby. And all my old Nazarenes knew it, and I mean, they're just belting it out. Well, you know, nice thing about hymns, I'm going to be, some people are going to not like me, but you, you, once you get the melody, you can sing it. Mm-hmm. Yep, you exactly. You, the yep. rest of it, you know, you're, you're down. You're down with it. <clears throat> I mean, the place came alive. Mm-hmm. Amen. It was Amen. so incredible. And you, the, you could feel the energy mm-hmm. of the mm-hmm. Holy Spirit. It's like, I wonder, maybe he'd come if we'd invite him. Mm-hmm. There's a thought. You just maybe take him mani- off the shelf. Maybe he'd manifest himself maybe if we actually acknowledge he was like, there. Yes. Oh, yeah, by the way, you know, and... And I mean to tell you, it was the most, and the little kids were singing it, and and it was a beautiful thing, and and the and the the energy, but and it wasn't just oh this was a fast song let's just sing, no, and, I mean there was the what? words, and it was like the the spirit of God you could just feel, came down, what? and it was, what? I mean just we were. It was a beautiful thing, a beautiful thing. Where you actually had to think about what you were singing. Yeah. Mm. Was, you had to beautiful. engage your mind. Yeah, okay, so you have an electrical panel, um, and you have wiring, and, and you have receptacles, and then you have the power. Um, and, you know, all we are is, uh, is a conduit. I mean, we don't, we don't do anything. All we are is the wiring. And, and and how I tend to see it sometimes, and Mark, you may touch on it. I've, I've said this, I've preached this before, I've talked about it before. I think the Holy Spirit, in an imagery, imagine this, is, is sits in the in the back corner of the of the sanctuary with his arms crossed and his feet up on the back pew, saying, "I wonder if anyone's going to invoke me today." Yeah. You know, he's just mm-hmm. sitting there waiting. Um, and but you know, and I think that, to answer this question, Andy, and this is just a, a Pentecostal's opinion. 
But I think all of this needs to come into the realm of a rabbinical discussion because that's the way it was. And people talking, you know, Jesus would bring his disciples into the portico of the temple, present a subject and say, fight. And it wasn't about one person telling the other person was wrong or, or want, figure out who was right. It was about God's spirit coming through their conversation. And the power then gets flipped on. The point is, is that if you wire your house wrong, you can flip switches everywhere. You can plug things in. There isn't going to be any power. The, the wiring has to be correct. Uh, part of the issue is it goes back to structure. How did the Holy Spirit come into people? It was by the laying on of hands. Okay, and it wasn't just the laying on of hands of some poor person who just met Jesus. By the way, new believers didn't even come into the church. They were part of the church, but they didn't worship in the church until they had been discipled. Uh, every single one of those letters in the New Testament, they're not written to unbelievers. They're written to believers who are walking in their faith. So that's why, you know, like when Paul says, oh, this wretched man that I am, he's not talking to an unbeliever. He's talking to other Christians, right? All these different things, when we get these theologies, we know information, but the problem is there's no incarnation. I, I agree. Right? Yeah. And the functionality is important too. It's like we think we can just take all this information, rearrange it any way we want, form our own little denominations, and create our own little structures. And then God just going to come in and make it work. God, do it our way. There's a reason why he set up his church the way he did. It's not because he's arbitrary and he's legalistic. It's because this is this is how it works. He knows that we're creatures because of the fall of man as well now that need to see a pattern. And God does things in patterns. And so he sends the apostle out with the with the evangelist and sometimes the prophet, especially the prophet who's called to the world. And they bring a message. And the evangelist brings people to the Lord. And the apostle then is the organizational person who forms and builds the church and appoints the elders and the deacons. And then the prophet brings a word and then they lay hands on people and they receive the spirit. And then this starts to happen and the power comes on and it happens all over again. But then, and I'm not saying we need to get back to some type of rigid type, but I think you guys know where I'm coming from here. Yeah, but it, I don't it, like that idea because it's not the way I like it. There you go. <laughs> definitely, well, definitely not my preference. It's not my yeah, preference. It's not my, probably you know. Not, probably not Mel's either. That's probably not Mel's either, yes, exactly. And well, I, guess, I, guess, I guess all I'm saying is, is that uh, um, are we going to try, are, are we going to be willing, if God was to tell you, all right, I want you to do this, are you going to be willing to do it? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting you bring that up. I was preaching in Galatians, and uh, it says there in Galatians 6, starting in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. We don't fool him. There we don't fool go. him. There you go. Plain and simple. For whatever one sows, he will also reap. We live in a sowing and reaping world. Yeah. It goes on, For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap from the flesh corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit... Mm -hmm will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And it's not just individuals, it's also congregations and, church, and the church Absolutely. As, a, as a whole, as a corporate. If we, you know. But are, both ways, yeah. God and Satan pay off in compounding interest. If we sow to the flesh, we are going to reap mm -hmm. a harvest of fleshly things. If we sow to the Spirit... The same thing happens. There is a there's, this, on there's a return on investment. Mm -hmm. Where are I'm we investing? Are we investing in the flesh, or are we investing in the spiritual? So, things? an individual, a congregation, or the church, absolutely, nationally or globally, spends all this time planting fleshy uh, building uh, buildings, uh, things, and then windows. we show up on a Sunday after we hear a cute little message, and we're like, okay, we want some power. Let's throw a seed in the ground real quick right here. Boom. And five seconds later, we don't see fruit, and we go, where's God? See, we don't go on to verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. If we put the work in. If we put the work in. And spend more time reaping life than death. Talk to a professional farmer. When you plant 5,000 acres of something, hmm. it's full-time work. It doesn't just instantly happen. I mean, you don't go out in the spring and plant seeds. No, you've spent all winter maintaining your equipment hmm. to be able to do that. 
you spend all summer making sure that the bugs are off, that no blight takes over your crop. I mean, it, it, this is hard work, mm -hmm. and that's the implication here. We do not grow weary of doing what God's called us to do as we sow in the Spirit. And we are bumping right up against the time where we uh, end this portion of our investment into far beyond the temple curtain. <laughs> Uh, and what I would like for us to do is maybe just go around the horn, just say some concluding remarks. So uh, would somebody like to lead off? Sure. I, I, the Trinity is a mystery, but it's not a mystery that we're not called to try and understand and apply to our lives. And I think it's all over Scripture. Let's dig in. Let's apply it to our lives. And then let's, let's teach people what we know and this is part of that as we sit down together have these discussions I'm not going to tell Aaron he's wrong or Mark he's wrong but how do you see this and how does that help us grow in our understanding mm -hmm. yeah. of the Trinity yep. Yep. Uh, the, it, it, I, I'll say in closing you know, and, and, and piggyback on what Bob just said this, this is what in the intimate Trinity I believe what God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit do Mm. They practice the function of conversation. Not uh, They're all of like mind. Well, what does Jesus say in the garden? He says, may they be one the way you and I are one, so that the world will know. If the world doesn't know, it's because we're not one. And look at the church. It's disjointed everywhere. Uh, I, I would encourage everyone, don't just think about the what is God. Think about the uh, what God does, how he does what he does. And, you know, reiterate what I said at the beginning. Uh, you know, God creates something out of nothing. Uh, many times, you know, that that's what the Father does. So look for those things in your life uh, where something came out of nothing. And, and, and when something is, is fixed and regenerated and made mm -hmm. renewed in your life, that's the Holy Spirit working. And, and mm -hmm. when something is formed... Uh, a, a physical blessing comes in. You know, where's Jesus now? He's, he's preparing a place for us. He'll come Amen. again. He'll rule Amen. physically again. You know, the physical interaction with us. And, uh, you know, look to those things. That's, that's not just how God is surmised, but that's how he interacts with you so that you can see him. Amen. I would say that God, God desires a personal relationship Amen. with us that has some corporate aspects so that he's going to reveal himself to us at times corporately, mm. but he's also going to reveal himself to us personally. Yeah, uh, and this goes the same way for the Trinity. Uh, there are aspects of this that you're going to learn mm -hmm. from, from us, from other people. And your understanding is, is going to increase because of that, but, n but nothing is going to uh, you know, compare with getting into this word and, and personally figuring out the Trinity God has a desire to reveal himself to you personally. Um, and that includes understanding of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. This is going to be deep. <laughs> Don't miss the dance. Amen. 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 And the dance is a mystery. Don't confuse mystery with contradiction or paradox. Yeah, Those yeah. terms are distinct. R.C. Sproul makes that point. We serve a mysterious trinity. Mm. That does not mean uh, the trinity cannot be apprehended. It just means that it cannot be comprehended. Mm -hmm. So when you read about the trinity, you want to understand what theologian B.B. Warfield said about it. And this is what he had to say. Uh, when we have said these three things, that there is but one God, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit is each God, that the Father and the Son and the Spirit is each a distinct person, we have enunciated the doctrine of the Trinity in its completeness. Mm. And in the following weeks, I think we'll talk about how did the church ever come up with this term Trinity? And why did it come about? Where do you find the Trinity in the Bible? Things like this, I think, will come in the next discussion we have on Far Beyond the Temple Curtain. Thank you for joining us during this time.